When I first finished Lords of the Fallen, and by that I mean when I suffered through the sloppy design and FPS issues that were ever present throughout my first playthrough, and finally uninstalled the game after seeing that the final boss was a deconstructed version of Deacons of the Deep, I figured it wouldn't be constructive to review or critique this game because I make no effort to hide the fact that I hate this game. I feel nothing but frustration and disgust towards this parasitic mess, and it wasn't worth my time to attempt to say anything objective when my mind was so clouded with rage. So I requested a refund, which seemed reasonable to me. A functioning game was promised at the point of transaction, and a functioning game I did not receive. You cannot have a Souls game with an unstable frame rate. Be like Minecraft without blocks, Call of Duty without guns, or Destiny without lies in their promotional material, cruel business practices, and anti-consumer microtransaction-based manipulation. The frame rate is everything for Souls, and any Souls veteran knows this. Most could even tell you the number of iframes in various Souls games dodge rolls. FromSoft also knows how important frames are. They have built-in protection for the frame rate in DS1 Remastered, slowing the game down to match the FPS in the rare instances where the FPS might dip. I didn't think it was the most unreasonable request to attempt a refund, but big surprise, I was denied. So now I permanently own this trash, which means I need to make the most of it. And so I reinstalled and played this game over and over, each time with a new starting class until I had played them all. I cleared my mind and wrote this script with a reasonable, rational, objective mindset, dissecting and analyzing everything that went into the making of Lords of the Fallen. Let me give you a little spoiler. This game is one of the most insulting pieces of garbage I have ever had the misfortune to be tricked into playing. So while I might get a little animated in the reading of this script, and my delivery might come off as angry and emotional, know that my words have been deliberately chosen and my thoughts have been meticulously thought out. Now at this point you might be asking yourself, who the fuck does this asshole think he is? Lords of the Fallen has been reviewed and received fairly positively and has sold well. What makes me think that I'm right and everybody else is wrong? Well I do have an answer for that, it's just not a very flattering one. You see, I think the current state of mainstream reviews are completely out of touch when it comes to Souls games. I think the majority of reviewers would be considered somewhat casual compared to me, though I would gladly take criticism myself on that if you have insight to share. It doesn't help things that most reviews come out as soon as possible in order to meet the demand for content and compete in online spaces. And so, from my perspective, these casual reviewers seemingly amount to playing the game once or twice and then typing out a bloated chunk of text that amounts to them saying, it was pretty and difficult, 7 out of 10. However, this approach often fails to consider the quality of the difficulty at hand. Bed of Chaos, for example, has many one-shot situations and a long, dangerous runback, meaning that for first-time players, it's very difficult, but it's by no means high quality. Capra Demon's limited arena space and dog ads make him quite difficult, but he's largely criticized for being gimmicky. Getting out of bed in the morning knowing that you got scammed by some scumbags for $70 is difficult but I can't exactly say that I'd recommend the experience. Another facet that holds back these reviews is that most rational people would rather not criticize a Souls-like too harshly for fear of being told to get good by ravenous fans. Oh, it was too difficult, so you have to complain. You think I haven't heard that before? You think I haven't stared down the barrel of the internet? I criticized Millennia on day one. I've taken heat from angry fanboys before, and I'll do it again. So do your worst. Because at the end of the day, I only care about understanding what's well-crafted and what's not. My goal is for everyone to get better, higher quality Souls games, so despite my pessimistic attitude, I can assure you that we're likely on the same side. My fear is that I've too often seen fanbases cause real tangible damage to the games they love for a variety of reasons, one of which being overly dick-riding communities that don't know what's good for them. Praising instant gratification moments because gratification feels good, only to have the devs accidentally cannibalize their game by listening to their communities for extended periods of time without making any decisions themselves. At a certain point, it becomes impossible to fix the mistakes of the past because peeling away the layers of quality of life changes feel like you're punishing your player base. Destiny and Ark come to mind as poignant examples. This natural, albeit stupid, turn of events is kind of the origin story of Souls games. The difficulty of Dark Souls 1 was refreshing during a time when games were growing tedious due to their simple, easy, one-size-fits-all designs. I was very near giving up gaming as a whole just before discovering Dark Souls 3, my real introduction to the series. And I fell in love with the charmingly restrictive gameplay and the immense reward of overcoming well-designed challenges. All of this is to say, I'm not just being a hater when I say I fucking hate Lords of the Fallen. I hold FromSoft's games very near and dear to my heart, 
and in many ways I hate this insulting knockoff in their defense. Which brings me to my first real point. Lords of the Fallen isn't a FromSoft game, it's a Souls-like. From my point of view, FromSoft games have consistently improved over time. You might have a personal favorite that you think is best, but I believe I can prove objectively that each game is stronger than its predecessor in one way or another. Each new entry in their catalog of Soulsborne games has further refined the concept to a point where Souls-like is a legitimate genre of its own, and that is unfathomably impressive. The fact that a huge chunk of the gaming industry has been inspired to imitate FromSoft's work, and not because it's easy, but because people love it, that's a testament to FromSoft's dedication and ingenuity. They've come a long way from the clunky, ugly mess that was the original Dark Souls, and learned a whole hell of a lot along the way. I am also in the process of making a video that takes a critical look at DS1, but I figured I would make this first because it's timely. I'm going to allude to a lot of the points I'll make in that, so you can consider this a preview of what's to come. That is largely because Lords of the Fallen is so stuck in the past when it comes to its design. I think most people would agree with me that this game has a similar feel to Dark Souls 2, and if you take a minute to analyze that, you will likely come to the conclusion that it emulates a series of DS2 ideas that are generally considered low quality. Acid spamming enemies and gangfest areas that the DS2 community lovingly calls spam bushes, boss fights that would otherwise be considered easy if it weren't for gimmicks thrown in such as bosses with healing effects that can only be mitigated outside of their arenas, soul gems, poorly mapped hitboxes, the list goes on and on. The problem with being made to so closely resemble Dark Souls 2 is that DS2 is a wildly flawed game, made at a point in time when Souls games were in their infancy and Souls likes didn't exist yet. Its image as a charming, janky old Souls game benefits from a sense of nostalgia that many players rightfully feel towards one of the foundational pieces of FromSoft's past. It would be easy for a seasoned Soul vet to point to a series of mistakes made in the development and design of DS2 while still holding a great deal of respect for the game. You can't do the same for Lords of the Fallen. Every mistake was made on their part. Every janky piece of design and awkward reuse of assets is entirely due to their lack of respect of FromSoft's hard work. There's no need to make these amateur mistakes because they've already been made before and learned from within the content they're copying from. If you're going to cheat off of someone who's ace in the class, you better get a good grade. Or the only conclusion left is that you're completely incompetent. Lords of the Fallen absolutely should not under any circumstances get to benefit from the nostalgia you feel for DS2. They didn't make it, they didn't care enough to learn from it. This whole game reeks of an insecure development that needed to crutch on something popular because nobody knew what Lords of the Fallen was before this reboot. And somehow, they've managed to cobble together a final release that was so shoddy, it managed to make DS2 looks like it runs well. Man, that's honestly just kind of impressive. Like, how the fuck is that even possible? On the opposite end of the spectrum, we have Lies of P, another Souls-like which took heavy inspiration from FromSoft's work, not only by learning from the mistakes of the past, but also by innovating beyond what From has yet to achieve. Sekiro's combat is widely considered to be more advanced than standard Dark Souls combat, which was refreshing, however it required standardizing the combat to a single weapon and severely limiting the options for build. Lies of P bridged the gap between the two systems and surprisingly created a system that was the best of both worlds. I've often heard Lies referred to as a love letter to the Souls series, and while I wouldn't want to use such emotional language to make that argument, I largely agree with the sentiment. Lies of P is impressively competent when it comes to the main facets that make Souls games work. The framerate is stable, the iframes and block frames are well balanced, the hitboxes fit tightly within enemy models and the player's weapons, the areas throughout the world offer rewarding shortcuts back to bonfires, and valuable loot for those willing to explore off the main path. It is clear to me that many people involved with the development of Lies of P are well experienced with Souls games and have a deep understanding of what makes them great. It could not have been a worse time to release Lords of the Fallen than to have to follow Lies of P. The difference between the two in terms of Souls competence is night and day, and I'm sorry if this upsets those of you who didn't like Lies of P but enjoyed Lords of the Fallen, but I have to be frank here. If you think Lords of the Fallen is a better game, as in higher quality in any parts of its design, you are dead wrong. It sickens me to see these two compared as though they are remotely equals. Lies of P is nearly perfect, save for a few problem areas. Lords of the Fallen feels like it was made on software that couldn't compete with Unity. Lies is steak dinner cooked personally by Gordon Ramsay. Lords is a McDouble you left in your car all day. And trust me, I don't even like steak, so I would probably go with a McDouble but the steak is objectively the better meal. So with that out of the way, 
Jesus Christ, that was just my intro. Let's get into the analysis. I'm going to take you through a playthrough of this game by talking about the bosses, basic enemy design, and level slash world design, followed by whatever wrap up I slap on the ass into this. Let's start with the first boss, the real meat of a Souls game. When those sandwiches complete without delicious bread and assortment of complimentary toppings, I think we can all agree that the meat is the star of the show. So what's our introduction boss to this game? Are you shitting me? A basic world enemy with a health bar slapped on it. That's how you want to start this game. Don't get me wrong, I know Light Reaper shows up immediately after this fight, but really? This is your tutorial boss. There have been so many instances of incredible tutorial bosses across Souls. Gundir, Genichiro, Parade Master and Lies, Cleric Beast and Gascoin. Lords of the Fallen starts with the guy who sexually assaults guts as a kid. I don't know, some dickhead with a mace. Who cares? Next. This incredible intro is followed up by your first encounter with the Light Reaper, a character in lore that aggressively stalks lamp bearers until ending them and adding their lamp as a trophy in a collection changed to his dragon. It's a pretty neat visual touch. Unfortunately, in the game, this guy's various encounters amount to letting him kill you as quickly as possible so you can continue the game. He then proceeds to let you respawn and continue without resistance until your next encounter. It's just strange to have this guy canonically kill you several times and fail to take your lamp from you. Just makes me wonder if the developers thought this made him intimidating. It doesn't. Just makes him look incompetent. If this game was made with any tact, they would skip the embarrassing Mace Guy fight and make a mandatory beatable fight with Light Reaver that only ends when you force the Reaver to tactically retreat. Maybe by killing one of his dragon's head at each encounter. Rather than having him repeatedly shout, Give me that lamp! before killing you and refusing to take that lamp. You continue through the game while learning the various umbral mechanics and fighting basic zombie enemies, as well as these seemingly out of place executioner enemies. They sort of look like a faction of cannibals, but they're just kind of everywhere in the game, so get used to them. The next fight is Pitya, and I can already hear people typing that she's the real tutorial boss, and I shouldn't have criticized the fights before. If that was the case, the game really should have started here, instead of making me do all that boring stuff which only serves to weaken one of the game's core villains. Pity is one of the better bosses in the game and the first boss I invested in learning the parries for. Unfortunately, the parry system is completely half-assed in this game. Perfect parrying rewards you by draining your stamina bar and bleeding wither damage into your health bar, meaning that a series of successful parries can be instantly undone by a single miss. You can fill your withered health back by dealing damage in between parries, because of course this game needed to pointlessly copy the rally system from Bloodborne, but this will further drain your stamina bar until your guard breaks and you're left staggered, so you better hope you filled enough health back to take the next incoming hit. I just don't understand what they were going for, because Wither is a specific damage type in this game. It's equivalent to the magic in Souls. So why the fuck do you take Wither damage from basic parried attacks? It makes no sense. Why not take fire damage or poison damage from parrying? For just throwing cause and effect out of the window, I guess nothing really matters. You could really just get rid of the wither damage and instead only cause the player damage on a miss or block, and the parry system would work fine. And it doesn't help matters that most bosses have an AoE on about half of their attacks that will hit you even if you parry the weapon. However, say you weather all these problems and parry every attack you can with perfect timing, dodges in between on attacks that you can't, all while carefully managing your stamina bar. What's your reward? about the same damage you would get from two light attacks? What the fuck? In most cases, you're better off forgetting the parries even exist, except for in one or two moves you can time well, if you feel like it, and then just dodge behind the boss every time and wail on them while your camera freaks the fuck out. Can this game do anything right? Well, yes, actually. I think the posture bar is fairly clever. Having a simple, unobtrusive indicator of the boss's posture that's positioned in a way that you don't have to look away from the fight to see it is a welcomed addition. It's just a shame that everything surrounding the system is low functioning at best. Like the boss is staggering every two hits. Low stagger resist of many bosses means you can often adopt a mindlessly aggressive mindset when going against many human-like bosses. This is admittedly a nitpick, but I think the game would certainly play better if they doubled the boss's stagger resists, making the fight more of a back and forth dance with constantly timed openings, rather than a clumsy mash of attacks. 
After beating this, you'll enter Skyrest Bridge, the Firelink Shrine of Lords of the Fallen, a hub area with many locked doors and paths that cannot be opened from this side, a staple of Dark Souls hearkening back to the interconnected world. Lords of the Fallen has seemingly taken great inspiration from the archaic design of FromSoft's flagship title, even to the point where New Game Plus gets rid of all bonfires in favor of its vestige seed mechanic, encouraging you to explore the world and learn all of its shortcuts. Something that might have been patched away as of the time of me writing this, but I don't really care because I'm not a New Game Plus kind of guy, and either way, the gamers released with this as a mechanic, meaning that was their original vision of design. One thing I need to get out into the open is that I don't believe DS1 ever even had an interconnected world. I will be delving into this further whenever I make my DS1 analysis, however, the short version of my analysis of an interconnected world will have to do for now. I believe that this concept is a misconception, and the very wording of interconnected world means that devs attempting to capture the classic feel of DS1 by making an interconnected world will be led astray by the long history of praise this concept has been given in the past. DS1 had interconnected areas, some of which being very large, often too large if you ask me. However, most of the game is considerably disconnected. Undead Asylum is not connected to the world, neither is Anor Londo or the Painted World, and after that point you gain access to the Lord Vessel and Warp, meaning that everything else doesn't even have to be connected to the world. This is in-game proof that even DS1 doesn't have faith in the connections of its world, which isn't a bad thing. Warp has become a staple of bonfires, and there's a reason for that. It's better game design to avoid wasting players' time. The lesson that FromSoft has learned through their game design, whether the community knows it or not, is that you still get the reward of exploring and finding shortcuts within areas that loop back to the same bonfire, offering you benefits for knowing the environment well without the baggage of having to trek all across all of Lordran if you simply allow warping to all bonfires and have interconnected areas. The developers of Lords of the Fallen obviously didn't realize that when making this mess. The hubris of taking away all bonfires in New Game Plus speaks to that. So while I don't believe that the concept of interconnected worlds has any real value, let's take a look at how Lords attempts to make this a reality. The traditional idea would be to have a hub area surrounded by several paths to take with objectives and items to collect at your discretion. Lords has one real path to take with mostly pointless shortcuts back to Skyrest at seemingly unimportant areas. You could argue you have the option to do Chill Curse or the Abbey first, however Chill Curse blocks you with a gank fight that gets exponentially easier the more damage you can do, and the Abbey is blocked by the purchase of the Pilgrim's Perch Key which costs 18,000 souls. Not an easy thing to do early game, which becomes pointless late game as the key is dropped for free at a certain point. This means that with any degree of rationality, Lords becomes incredibly linear. You play Upper Calrath, then Abbey, then Fief, and then suffer through the god-awful Bramus Castle. And so, I declare the addition of any interconnected concepts to be all but pointless in a mostly linear game, which leaves every design choice made to instill that notion into the game at the cost of player experience to be an absolute failure, and I will point them out as I go. Starting with the Vestige Seed mechanic. Anyone who knows the basic trivia of Souls games knows that FromSoft toyed with the idea of being able to place and light your own bonfires in the early development of DS1. They thoughtfully decided that this mechanic would be completely unbalanced, as players would either have a bonfire before every single boss, eliminating the notion of having to understand the world well to avoid wasting your healing items before reaching the boss, or they would run out of materials to make a bonfire and have a run back that was needlessly punishing. FromSoft understood well that a curated challenge would offer a more rewarding and balanced challenge for players. And while this does bring into question some of the more unbalanced encounters they've knowingly designed in the past, the intention was to offer a balanced experience. Lords of the Fallen's Vestige Seeds attempt to recreate this unfinished idea and ends up creating a system as half-baked as you would assume it to be. Your options for seedbed positions include being so close to enemies that you have to kill them every time you want to use your bonfire, as well as positioned after every single boss, despite the fact that many bosses are positioned at dead ends or immediately followed by legit bonfires. And there are seedbeds followed by short areas of nothing, followed by more seedbeds. This system offers nothing more than a mini-game of figuring out which seedbeds are the right and wrong ones to use, and the developers could have just as easily placed real bonfires at all the right places, just like FromSoft decided to do a long time ago. So with that out of the way, we set off from Skyrest in the one direction we can. You'll encounter basic melee enemies as well as these stick-wielding mages that will become infuriating soon enough, in this instance for being out of reach while casting spells at you. 
though this is not the only irritating trick they have up their sleeve. You'll soon after reach the Scourged Sister Deleth, and she is somewhat special in that I believe she is a unique enemy not placed anywhere else in the game. This is strange being that she's pretty boring and seemingly acts just like a world enemy. She's the first of many bosses in this game to implement the invincible until you suck an umbral fruit mechanic, which adds nothing but a tedious extra step to the fight. Punishing her back is almost always followed by a quick zero damage kick, which doesn't really do much. It's just kind of annoying. I wouldn't really want to fight her if she wasn't mandatory, which is about the worst thing you could say about a boss. Every once in a blue moon, I feel the urge to fight Millennia, which means progressing through the game till Mountaintop of the Giants, collecting the secret Halig Tree medallions, which involves surviving Castle Soul and beating Commander Nial, then progressing through the Consecrated Snowfield, beating the Ordina puzzle, making your way through the Halig Tree branches, beating Loretta, and passing through the rotten base of the Halig Tree just to reach her. Contrasting that, if she was optional, I would skip Sister Deleth every single time if it meant just walking past her. You'll next be tasked with traversing the dangerously vertical Pilgrim's Perch area, which is filled with more mages that have access to a force-like melee designed to push you off the edge of cliffs. These dickheads are lovingly placed at several points in the game, just out of sight until they've already hit you, knocking you to your death. There are also new pyramid head looking enemies, which have way too much health for just how simplistic their moveset is. As you travel across the perch, you'll soon realize that this game is actually a platformer, forcing you to use the awkward Dark Souls style jump to complete various platform sections. The difficulty of this skyrockets when ranged enemies are nearby, as the standard medium weight load dodge sends you flying an insane distance, often resulting in your death. It is rarely beneficial to do anything more than eat the shot or block at best. You'll end this section by doing an umbral puzzle that involves grabbing blue things, well, realizing just how spastic the lock-on system is. Enemies much further away and much further outside of your center of vision will often get priority over the puzzle object you're trying to interact with, which leads me to wonder if the developers wanted you to clear every single enemy before doing the puzzle, or if their design was truly this unpolished. The game itself would speak to the latter, as umbral puzzles are only doable in the umbral, the world that infinitely spawns enemies. Who fucking designs like this? You'll reach a bonfire, then continue through the Pilgrim's Perch, a vertical platforming area filled with mages and pyramid heads which ends with an umbral pulling puzzle. And at this point you might be asking yourself, didn't I just do this? And that is because this game is absolutely bloated with near identical areas placed directly after one another. I assume this is to easily inflate the runtime of the game, but your guess is as good as mine. Just get used to it, because this is far from the last time it takes place. You'll also find the first of the Umbral Fly Whore enemies in this part of Pilgrim's Path. They spawn Umbral Zombies and then hit you with several Wither-based attacks, in hopes of teeing you up for a one-shot zombie slap and, once again bafflingly, they're usually placed inside of Umbral Puzzles. Meaning your attempts to lock on will be constantly interrupted by the newly spawned zombies as well as the targetable eggs within the areas they spawn in, delaying you from completing your objective until you're perfectly wombo comboed while lamp grabbing. The unbearably frustrating aspect of these scenarios is that you're usually forced to attempt to complete these puzzles as soon as possible, as failing the grabs or failing to kill the flywoman will quickly have both her zombie spawns as well as the natural umbral spawns swarming you within seconds. This results in a two sides of the same coin outlook. You can either risk being wither slapped to death by hastily attempting the lamp grabs as fast as possible and then dying and respawning and trying again quickly, or you can attempt to clear the area first, which could easily end with your death either way given the insane amount of variables in play. You're damned if you do, and damned if you don't, and the best way to avoid this situation is by never purchasing the game in the first place. I recommend placing a Vestige Seed at the following location. This is for several reasons, the first of which being that the blacksmith is unlockable here, and you'll very much want to return to Skybridge to upgrade your weapon for the next fight. The second is that you might be tempted to use this elevator shortcut back to the bonfire. This is the single worst shortcut I've ever seen. The elevator cannot be sent back up, a system that has been standardized in Souls since DS1, possibly Demon Souls. The fact that it isn't included here can only mean that the devs made a conscious choice that players should have to wait to recall this elevator at every attempt on the next boss. This is blatantly poor design, but we're just getting started, aren't we? To add insult to injury, two seconds past this terrible shortcut, you're forced to ride a second elevator which will need it calling back every time including the first fucking time you use it. 
what more could I possibly say about these devs having no respect for your time when they force you to call up a one-way elevator that, for your sake, I hope you only have to use once. The next boss is mandatory and one of the most insulting bosses in the game. A single ranged world enemy surrounded by a never-ending supply of dog ads which are one of the worst enemies in the game. They seem to only have one attack, a charging bite that deals bleed damage, but also seems to have a system in place to prevent them all from attacking at once. This should be a nice feature to avoid being swarmed and stunlocked, however this only really means that whatever dog is next in line to attack will always be ready to attack. Their simplistic behavior will often have you sprinting away from the group of them until you've made enough distance to heal, only to have the lead dog jump your ass with his charge, leaving you to heal once more and the cycle repeats itself. All the while, you're made to dodge gentle Garvus's arrows. There is no real interesting or skillful way to beat this boss. Your options amount to either having an absurd amount of damage so as to one-shot the dogs, or if that's not an option for you, using hit-and-run tactics to sprint around in a circle like an asshole being chased and dodging arrows. This makes me wonder what the devs' intentions with this fight were. What fantasy could this possibly fulfill? The answer is none. It was just supposed to be challenging, and the only way to do that was to fill this room with ads. And the most annoying thing of all is that everyone should know at this point not to do that. Because Capra Demon did it, and it fucking sucked. And that's like the third fight in DS1. And at least you can say his fight isn't mandatory. This is just embarrassing. Shortly after, you'll fall down a hole and on top of the Congregator of Flesh. There's no other way to describe this fight other than sloppy, you're once again forced to start the battle with some busy work involving finding and sucking off the Congregator's Umbral Bug, which is giving him armor. Again, this adds nothing to the fight but tedium, but I suppose I should mention another mechanic of the game at this point that is beyond incompetent. Reclaiming your souls is basically a standardized experience at this point. It's a pretty good balance of punishment for failing while offering the opportunity to redeem yourself by making it back to the point where you failed at. Lies of P innovates this in favor of the player by offering your souls at the Fog Gate to avoid locking your precious resources behind beating the boss. This could be looked at as hand-holding the player or as a pleasant innovation that minimizes frustration. Think of it what you will. Lords, on the other hand, goes in the opposite direction, favoring punishment. Upon re-entering the boss battle after a failure, the player must reach their souls and then do an interruptible animation to reclaim them. This is obnoxious design. This is the kind of design we left behind a long time ago. In most cases, the failure of dying to a boss is the punishment itself. You failed the run, so try again. Punishing the player beyond that is setting them up to fail and amounts to kicking the player while they're down. Similar systems would be Demon Souls and DS2 reducing the player's health after a death, which is asinine and only punishes the more casual players who are likely already having a hard time. Forcing you to find an opening to suck off the boss's umbral bug, then also find an opening so that you can safely grab your souls without eating a shot makes an already boring boss like the Congregator even more boring and annoying to learn. On a side note, Lords of the Fallen also uses the mechanic in Bloodborne where an enemy can eat your souls, which can also take place in boss fights where non-bosses are present. Actually, strike that. Upon further analysis, even bosses can eat your souls because the game has absolutely no consistency on what it considers a boss. This mechanic is antithetical to the design of the runback as it requires you to beat the enemy who last killed you, which inherently implies you have to have a better run than your last to keep your souls, not just an equal run. This is even worse in Lords than in Bloodborne because killing the enemy doesn't give you back your souls, it drops them, so you still have to risk the animation to pick them back up, potentially within a boss fight. This design was old already and it should have been left in the past, yet Lord somehow brought it back and made it worse than it was originally, which is just insulting. Kinda let that tangent get away from me, but I think it was important to say. Anyway, the Congregator begins his fight with bugs sucking. I guess I'll just call it that from now on because it's honestly gonna just get tedious describing the time-wasting mechanics of each boss if I don't start using keywords. Bug sucking in this case is essentially a disengagement from the fight to find a little nutsack following the boss around before he recovers from an opening. 
However, you never really engage with this boss in any meaningful way. It has so many random slams and splatters which fill the arena with poorly visualized clouds of poison that you'll rarely feel like the boss is even targeting you. If it is, it locks on with sloppily telegraphed arm slams with two different timings, an utterly embarrassing hitbox after its bite dash that only attempts to deal damage at the very point of contact, leaving you inside the charging monster's mouth for most of the attack with no damage. I'm not saying the attack should deal damage the whole time because that would make the attack basically undodgeable, maybe just don't go to a moveset that looks fucking stupid. Yeah, maybe just stop making games, I think that's my point. This fight was seemingly made to look cool in the trailer for the game, but it's largely frustrating and mostly feels out of place. There's no real reason this pit of corpses should be here, it's just a boss fight for the sake of boss fight, and it's a pretty lazy forgettable one at that. You'll likely have used up your umbral buffer life in that fight, but not to fear, there's an effigy to return you to life shortly after. Immediately followed by a section that forces you to go umbral. Immediately followed by a bonfire to return you to life. Kind of weird design, but whatever. You'll continue through the swamp encountering these gru like enemies that seem to have hyper poise when attacking, however have zero poise when not. Not that you would ever kill any of them, rather than run past them with the hundred other enemies following you, including the dogs of this area. These poison fish things that roll around behind you waiting to get a cheap shot when you run out of stamina. All the while, the stilted plague doctor enemies will throw poison vials at you when in range. This area is one of the most consistently laggy for me and I was constantly dying to it. Hidden amongst this area is an optional fight which forces you to enter the Umbral. Mr. Potato Head only exists in the Umbral, but you won't know that until you see the world enemy variant they throw in in the least advantageous positions, punishing you for wasting your Umbral buffer life. But I'm getting ahead of myself. This boss is only damageable from the back unless you wait for it to open its face or rip open its face with Soul Flay, one of the only unique Soul Flay interactions in the game. It has a series of ground pound slams, some wither projectiles, and an attack that spawns wither worms across the battlefield. It's not the most engaging fight as you'll spend a good amount of time donking your weapon against its armored face. At this point you'll be coming up against the first beacon guardian fight, the fleshed saint. This fight is generally not that bad, however you only really get a chance to fight the fight of this fight for a little while before the boss decides to fuck off somewhere and enter an immunity phase. In phase 1 that begins with him summoning his horse which is invulnerable and in phase 2 he'll simply fall to the ground and stay there for a few seconds at a time. Downtime within a boss fight is generally a bad idea for anything more than a few seconds, with some kind of spectacle moment, usually a phase 2 introduction. So the frequency of this boss's departures and immune sections gets a little frustrating, especially when his melee moveset is pretty good. In phase 1 you'll have 3 options when dealing with the horse riding saint. You can wait for him to jump off, which takes the longest, you can parry him off, which is the most dangerous, or you can go umbral before the fight and suck off an umbral fruit when he gets close. My personal favorite method after some practice is to parry him off, which comes with huge advantages but also has its pitfalls. The first is to figure out the timing of the move, which took me a while because the move is pretty unintuitive. The attack isn't timed with its proximity to you, it's purely timed to swing after a certain amount of time. Positioning becomes critical to your success as standing too close to the beginning of the horse charge will result in the horse trampling you before the attack can even begin, with the saint mindlessly swinging at nothing while you pick yourself back up. This deals a hit to the immersion of the game, making the boss feel like it's just a set piece in those moments, rather than an opponent actually attempting to kill you even if the situation is avoidable by player intervention. By positioning yourself right and nailing the timing, you knock the saint off his horse, which is uniquely an instant benefit following a single parry, and that's refreshing in a game with a terrible parry. This move also leaves you with a reasonable opening to refill your withered health you received from the parry. This single interaction proves that the parry could have been useful if the devs had found clever ways to implement it, however the parry is instead left in an awkward middle ground between the deflection posture system of Sekiro and the slower stamina lowering block and parry of Dark Souls, stuck between being difficult to master and having very little reward. Especially when contrasted against the strategy of mindlessly wailing on everything. There's not much more to say about this boss, it has a necessary obligatory use of the umbral fruit way too much downtime, but other than that it functions as a boss, and that's about as much as you can ask for in this turd. Now for some minor praise. I appreciate that the exit of this fight is highlighted by a lighting cue. It's always nice to have a simple, natural way of hinting where the player should go, rather than the ugly artificial method like Resident Evil 4's yellow paint. 
And yet, this praise can only last for so long. The next area of the game has a very subtle fork in the road that you might not even know exists, especially when being chased by the new dog enemy, the fire-breathing skull dog that explodes when killed. I took the left path which led me to an optional Holy Knight fight with Umbral Foot that stagger and absorb his whole energy. A gimmick that does not justify making a world enemy a boss. Yawn. However, the part that was incredibly confusing was that this path resulted from the unintended consequences of this game having an interconnected world. It brought me back to Skyrest, leading me to believe that this was the end of the road. I scoured the other paths leading from Skyrest in search of the next area of the game, only to find a bunch of pointless routes that eventually brought me back to Skyrest once more. It wasn't until I googled the walkthrough that I realized I had missed the linear path forward to Fitzroy Gorge. This is one of the many problems of forcing a pointless connectivity to your world design, especially when there is very much a singular right path to take, leading to the only next objective I could possibly have. After taking the right path, I ended up in a cavern with a new type of enemy, a Gorgon Archer with explosive arrows and deployable trip mines. This enemy always feels out of place. It's such a strange sight when positioned next to regular human executioners. Just a nitpick, but this world is definitely hemorrhaging weird character designs that don't feel like they should fit together in any reasonable way. It doesn't help that they essentially act as normal archer enemies. It would have been a nice touch to have their demonic Gorgon elements show up in gameplay, but they just shoot arrows and drop traps. This is also the first time you'll see the Umbral Gargoyle enemies, which I missed on my first playthrough, being that it just drops from the ceiling on you and explodes. I wasn't sure what happened, I was just sprinting through to the next seed bed. However, while sprinting through this area, being tailed by dogs and shot at by archers, you might just come upon an item looking like many other while hastily sprinting around. You would have no way of knowing that this item is out of place, so you grab it and get punished by the most controversial enemy in the whole game. The Umbral Mimic Moth is likely going to have you liking or hating it with a very little room in between. Personally, I think they're horribly designed. And I know I'm once again opening up myself to get good comments just by mentioning this, however, here is my argument. The systems at hand in Lords leads you to gameplay that is often frantic in pace. Hordes of enemies are likely to be following you around at any point in this game. There is rarely a situation in which you have the time to sit still and wait for any given item to wiggle its tail. The unintended consequence of this design decision is that you'll have to come up with a strategy to avoid being grabbed and ripped into the umbral on the fly. For me, this means I don't grab any item I don't need. Once I have the rings I need and my weapon upgraded, I leave everything else on the ground. I would argue this method as best, being that most of the drops in the game are complete garbage. If you don't get one of the 50,000 weapons they designed, then you'll likely pick up a map item that doesn't do anything or an armor shader. The restrictive nature of this enemy will naturally restrict the way you play in certain areas, and it doesn't offer much in return. If you can locate the moth and soul flay, you generally end up with some garbage drops and a homeward bone. This does not justify the agency being taken away from the player in order to set up the gimmick. The last point I'll make on these things is to point out just how unbalanced it is that these things are also invisible in the umbral when they're fucking umbral creatures. Was it so important to set up the prank enemy that insta-kills you that it justifies breaking the rules of the dumbass boring universe you've built in your shitty knockoff game? Because I don't think it was. On a side note, why the fuck did they design so many weapons in this game? Like, how many times did they expect people to play this garbage? I mean, seriously, was 90% of the development team set on making weapons while, like, two assholes made the rest? Because that would honestly explain a lot. After continuing on this path, you'll find your way to the Ruiner boss fight. Not the worst encounter in the world, but it does end up feeling very lacking in terms of engagement. This world enemy has a series of fire-based moves with AoE explosions and lingering lava pools that often leave you with little more than the option of tanking the hit while dealing with the Ruiner's other moveset or backing away from the fight and into safety. A similar situation comes into play when the Ruiner spawns its idol, which you can either hit after luring the boss away from it while taking care not to be hit by its defensive AoE explosions, or ignore it and fight the boss with its increased armor. It doesn't help that this world enemy has a grossly inflated health bar for the sake of increasing its difficulty. More often than not, I feel like this boss outstays its welcome, sometimes even to the point where you've seen his entire moveset 20 times over and he still has a quarter of his health left. Next you bathe in lava because the useless Light Reaper shows up, enjoy the run back. The following boss is also a world enemy, 
Its gimmick to increase its difficulty and justify not having to make a real boss here is four umbral fruit that project a one-time use DOT fire shield on the Enchantress, one of which is bafflingly positioned behind her, which generally means you'll have to push through her massive flame shield to break it or sacrifice your buffer life and hit it with a ranged attack once umbral. Either situation feels like you're doing something wrong and being punished for it, however the meta realization you'll eventually come to is that you're just being punished for playing a game made by incompetent lazy developers spamming boring mandatory world enemy boss fights throughout their uninspired ripoff game just to inflate the runtime. Though I suppose I'm getting ahead of myself as we have a long way to go from here. The Infernal Enchantress has like 5 moves none of which feel good to engage with, and once again outstays her welcome, and somehow I'm feeling like the next fight will too. After continuing through the city and crossing an umbral platform, you'll meet an infernal enchantress. Are you fucking kidding me? This is like six enemies past the boss. Fucking embarrassingly lazy. Anyway, you continue through the city, and is that the fucking ruiner? WHAT THE FUCK?! WHAT THE FUCK?! So you make your way through the rest of the city while constantly being targeted by this infernal enchantress move. Fucking obnoxious. I would go through the effort of killing her, but she's just plain boring, so I'd rather just dodge the fireballs. Spurned Progeny has a reasonably complex moveset. Unfortunately, that moveset is split into several parts that ultimately amount to two simplistic movesets. HX is a combination of a classic giant-style boss such as Last Giant, Fire Giant, or Giant King in Phase 1 and then becomes a set-piece boss like Ceaseless Discharge or Old Iron King in his Phase 2, a combination of fights that nobody was asking for. His damage is immense at times, because there was no real way of making a boss like this difficult without having several moves that will one-shot you at this point in the game, which becomes unacceptable when its moveset consists of multiply differently timed moves with nearly identical startup animations with mismatched hitboxes in favor of cheap shots often leaving you confused as to how you ended up dying mid-roll as the attack animation was over but the delayed slam with the delayed hitbox and insane damage just barely managed to clip you at the end of your iframes. If avoiding his moveset wasn't enough to irritate you in this fight, then surely the poorly mapped hitboxes on your weapon will push you over the edge. I suppose DS2 walked with sloppy design so Lords of Fallen could run with sloppy design, if you can even get it to run at all. This fight ends with the boss using its nuke over and over as a last ditch effort to end you, leaving a huge opening between each blast, and I can't help but to wonder how this dude is able to repeatedly summon the power of the sun, but he doesn't have the energy left to stand. Surely expending your last bit of energy would leave you utterly helpless, right? Old Demon King did it better. Though I don't think I should have to mention that every facet of DS3 is better than this game in every way. After the progeny, you end up in the sewers under Kalrath, and are forced to traverse the most bloated area of the game. Even when running past every enemy, this area is bound to take a considerable amount of time with nothing of value between. You're cut off by a gate, so you find a way around by going through an umbral gate, falling down a hole, walking through water, going umbral to pass an obstacle, ascending a spiral staircase, and then hitting a lever to open the gate and progress. This is followed by two more instances of the exact same situation with different orders. Umbral gate, water, spiral staircase, umbral obstacle, and lever. This time, it's covered in umbral goo which prevents your progress unless you hit the bonfire nearby. Unfortunately for me, on my first playthrough, I didn't see the lever hidden underneath the goo and was left wandering around for a good amount of time before noticing it. The lever itself is also a strange waste of your time as it opens a drain that serves to make you a bridge across to the next area. Except it's not this wooden bridge, it's the gate itself. So you walk around and kick the wooden bridge down, and I can't help but to wonder why the drain gate wasn't positioned where the wooden bridge was. Why does this game have to be as tedious as possible at every step? The little things are clearly not what makes or breaks this game, however there are so many subtle instances of oversight leading to frustration that I can't help but to think the developers of this game never played a game before in their lives, least of all their own. You continue in the sewers, once again being halted by a closed gate, proceeding by finding a path around, through an humble gate, up a staircase, falling down a hole and pulling a lever, three incredibly similar instances back to back convoluted gate openings, two of which you'll never walk through again, being that a bonfire is placed just before the last. 
This is objectively pathetic game design, which proves just how little these people understand about designing interconnected areas, and highlights why their interconnected world sucks ass. You could have had one bonfire at the beginning, with the unlockable gates giving you a simpler run back at each checkpoint, and no checkpoint being mandatory if you're willing to risk it all in one run. However, no unlockable checkpoint can be all that valuable in a game where you have an inventory of vestige seeds to plant whenever you feel like it. And so your final project becomes a boring mess of objectives to sprint through as fast as possible, because nothing remotely interesting can happen in these areas. And now that you've passed through, you plant the seed before the next boss, so you never have to see the sewers again. The next boss is Skin Stealer, and it's just training wheels for Light Reaver. It would have been impactful if we hadn't already seen and fought Light Reaver twice by now. At this point, I usually double back and take the optional route to the Umbral ending area and the best fight in the game. However, unfortunately, this area is blocked by another and insulting mess that these dicks have the nerve to call a boss. It's three Grim Reapers. That's all. They're identical in every way, but they're given unique names, which makes me wonder just how stupid these devs think their audience is. These incorporeal flying ghosts can also glitch and fall to their deaths, so this fight is not only lazy, boring, and insulting, but also poorly designed. While traveling through the depths, you'll come across this new enemy, an invisible archer man with poison arrows and a melee sword attack. It's a fucking reskin of Gentle Gavaris. Fuck me, I thought she was at least gonna wait till the Abbey to be copy and paste into this shit. After traversing the depths, you'll come upon the single best fight in the game. It's Guts with a Pussy. The moveset is pretty good, minus a couple untelegraphed moves, which I thought to be strangely poorly made in such an important fight. It wasn't until I fought the Holy Knight at the shortcut back to Skybridge a second time before I realized why that is. She's a fucking world enemy in Phase 1. They gave her a gat and a goth girlfriend who constantly rains down massive AoE wither attacks and buffs while you're trying to focus on the fight at hand, but besides that, she has the moveset of a regular ass holy knight world enemy. <sighs> I really wanted to like this fight too. Phase 2 can be pretty simplistic and the umbral fruit mechanic makes the fight pretty easy, as each fruit essentially acts as a full heal so long as you can land shots to refill the withered health. On that note, why the fuck do the fruits offer such a strange array of effects? It's really boring to have the alternate world to be chopped full of monochromatic nonsense and to cheap out on the assets related to the main mechanic of the game. There's like 10 different umbral effects and it all comes down to a single asset for a bug and a single asset for a fruit. Anyway, I like this fight even though it's pretty sloppy. It's kind of like Artorias if he was made in DS2. The next area of the game comes down to which of the key areas you want to go to to beat their beacon guardians. Before I realized you can unlock large derillium fragments upon reaching the Imperium, I would go with Thief of the Chill Curse and endure the absolute worst content this game has to offer. Let's begin. The intro fight to the Thief is the tutorial boss reskinned with an ice axe. Along with him you get a reskin of three dogs, which can now drop a lingering line of ice crystals to block your path. The arena is full of water, which slows your movement and the four enemies are made immune by an umbral fruit. You can enter the umbral to get rid of the water and allows you to melee the fruit, however, Mr. Fucking Potato Head will be waiting there for you on the other side. An enemy, you may remember, that can spawn seven wither worms to track you and explode on you. What kind of deranged, misguided, brain-dead development team would create something so unbelievably lazy and infuriating just to pretend that their hack-job pale imitation of a shitty old Souls game has even a fraction of difficulty in it? This is it. We found the bottom of the barrel. There's nothing that I can meaningfully say to analyze this, it's just indefensible. It barely even matters to say that the following area has another copy and paste of Gentle Gavarius, but with ice now, or that the following boss is just prowling magus in the congregation, but with an ice whore. The most forgettable world enemy in the game, with some of the most annoying untelegraphed attacks, with like five zombies thrown in. The only thing imaginable that could be even worse than this would be if they combined both of these lazy garbage fights into one, right? Right? I don't know what to say anymore. It just keeps getting worse and worse. There's nothing redeemable about this. I think... I think this game is giving me clinical depression. It sold a million copies. There are people out there struggling to make art, 
pouring their hearts and souls into honing their crafts. And these fucking scumbags sold a million copies of their intellectually bankrupt shit stain of a game after hitting copy and paste 50,000 times. The sad thing is that this fight would be pretty cool as a Diablo fight. However, instead we get an entirely mechanical set-piece boss made by people who completely fail to understand the strengths and weaknesses of a Souls-like. We've already seen mechanical set-piece bosses, and we know they're terrible. Bed of Chaos is widely considered to be the worst fight in all of Soulsborne, and instead of flailing limbs and pitfalls, they add gank and RNG ice explosions. Utterly incompetent design. The other key path will take you to the backside of Pilgrim's Perch, punctuated by a fight with the Bell Knight. The fucking introduction boss again. This time with a massive AoE bell attack and buffable with holy damage. He's surrounded by those stick-wielding dickheads who are made immune by an umbral fruit positioned at the center of the arena. And the boss itself has an umbral parasite for armor. I say once again, yawn. Continue to work your way to the abbey until you reach a locked door, the key to which is being held by a mandatory fight with... The introduction boss. You can't make this fucking shit up. I'll take this opportunity to point out just how much these enemies remind me of the Hide Knights from DS2, especially when they do this incredibly quick slice move. Kind of funny to mention considering the Hide Knights are considered one of the most annoying enemies in one of the worst Souls games and these developers copy and pasted them into the majority of the fights in the game. Soon after, you'll see this wonderful set piece. You move the platform, and then get on it, and then move it again. They had an entire second world within their game. A world of death and decay that offers new perspectives and a second chance to redeem yourself should you fall in battle. A world that I'll remind you, makes their game run like shit because of all the extra assets running in tandem with unique meshes and ambient effects. They chose to take the risk of implementing this feature at the cost of extra development efforts and potential bugs and performance issues. And this is what they do with it. Peak Lords of the Fallen gameplay. Soon after you'll begin to notice a series of it doesn't open from this side door surrounding a single chamber of this castle. As you work your way around it, you'll eventually find an optional fight with two statue knights called the Abiding Defenders, and... Wait a second. This fight is actually good. Rather than spamming a gankfest of garbage, this fight offers an aggressive melee-based knight and a knight that keeps its distance and casts spells that feel well-balanced and are telegraphed well. When one knight goes down, the other one... Let's just be honest, it's just a Throne Watcher and Defender mechanic, but it's done surprisingly well. Maybe my standards have been lowered to a point where I feel like not fucking up basic concepts should be praised, but this fight is incredibly refreshing after enduring some of the worst boss designs this genre has ever seen. I'll take it. Following this fight, you'll continue through this castle, ascending it, saying hello to the bitch-ass bell prick at the top, and then descending it till you drop onto the closed-off center chamber. Now, what possibly could reside at the center of this convoluted set piece? Just how many branching options are you opening up for yourself when entering a chamber with so many shortcut doors? None. Yeah, none. You just grab the key at the center of the room and then leave. The room was pointless, the shortcuts were pointless, and the only spots you'll likely drop a vestige seed were already on the side of the castle where you'll be heading next. You never come back here, it was all pointless, and I'm getting tired of pointing this out, but this is once again pathetic level design. Continuing from this area, you'll have a chance to grab a saintly quintessence. Unfortunately, it's being guarded by two grim reapers, which were so much fun to fight in their copy-paste boss fight. Rather than deal with that, I usually go umbral right in front of the grab spot, and then hope my lock-on actually works on the single thing on my screen. The item drops, you die while doing the animation, but the umbral enemies can't eat your souls, and the item is dropped in the real world. This also saves you the trip back to the last vestige to emerge from umbral. These are the kind of backwards tactics you learn when playing a game so poorly designed. Past this point, headed towards the Tower of Penitence, there's another boss. Except when there isn't. Oh, okay, never mind, there he is. The one benefit of playing a game that runs like shit is that you can sometimes glitch the game in your favor, and by in your favor, I mean not having to play the content in the game. Because just take a guess at what this boss is. If you said anything other than the introduction boss, you haven't been paying attention. 
You might have been fooled being that they didn't just reskin him and give him a different gimmick this time. He has a whole new weapon. However, you can easily tell once he does his grab attack. This boss also has the added benefit of filling the entire arena with poison and then taking 25 seconds to die after his health bar is drained. Just in case you might not have gotten killed by something cheap or stupid in the last five minutes. Oh, also he has a bug to suck. Who cares? He'll take an elevator to the top of the Tower of Penitence. That is, if you can't get the door to stay glitched and despawned long enough to get inside. And then proceed to drop floor by floor while getting shot by archers just hidden out of sight while camping the bottom of your ladders. This area is once again an instance of mundane bloat as three of the floors will have you finding a lever guarded by... The Introduction Poison Knight, with some platforming between each section. Upon reaching the bottom, you will find the Beacon Guardian boss for this tower, Tancred, Master of Castrations. That's honestly the first time I've cared enough to read his name. Firstly, he has a bug to suck for some reason. His moveset is pretty good, but can drag on and feel pretty boring, especially when he brings up his shield for extended amounts of time. He has several moves involving his shield. He's a copy and paste of the Hushed Saint. There are four fights directly guarding beacons, and two of them are the same fight. You have got to be joking. Is this game a fucking parody? Are we being pranked? I don't... I don't feel well mentally anymore. I've played this game so many times, it's becoming attached to me. I spent so much time in this game, mostly attempting to strategize how to spend the least amount of time possible in this game, figuring out the optimal routes, best ways to get powerful fast. I've learned these boss fights so well in an attempt to avoid any wasted time dying to them. I've reached a point where I can make a completely rational objective statement about the abysmal quality of this piece of shit, and I end up hurting my own feelings. I get upset at myself for pointing out obvious flaws in this game's design because I've forced myself to spend so much time in this game. I feel the irrational urge to defend it. That time... That time I spent was supposed to have meaning to me. I invested myself in this, poured myself into this for days at a time. But it doesn't have any meaning. This game is completely meaningless. It's so unbelievably lazy. And that just fucking sucks. It sucks to play, it sucks to think about. It sucks putting down people who like it. it sucks to review, this fucking review sucks. I think I've forgotten what quality feels like. While writing this part of the first draft of this script, I still have like five more playthroughs. And it honestly feels like I'm staring into the abyss. I don't, I don't really want to go on. This whole process has been miserable. I only have one trick left up my sleeve, and that's to remind myself what art is. Time to remind myself why it's worth criticizing something terrible, and that's to better understand and appreciate something incredible.
With my mind refreshed, I returned to this project with a renewed sense of purpose. I was now fueled by the love I feel for something important to me, and not just the hate I feel for something insulting. Let's continue with phase two of Tancred. This part of the fight generally feels pretty bad, you'll often feel punished for locking on, and will likely choose to simply leave yourself unlocked and awkwardly attempt to manually control your camera while trying to damage the boss. Personally, I find phase two to be much easier than phase one, and this is mostly due to the moments where you're forgiven for being greedy, as attacking his legs as often as possible will generally pull you past the boss's melee hitbox. Once again, this boss as a whole feels like it outstays its welcome, though the phase two at least tries to change up the formula by adding lingering lava pools to some of its attacks halfway through its health bar. I consider this a sloppy way to increase difficulty, which doesn't really add much for the player, it mostly just limits your openings and prolongs the fight even further. Now you might consider this point kind of petty and subjective, which I would admit to be a fair assessment, however it is my honest opinion that this game has some of the most basic visual concepts, especially when it comes to the demonic side of the game. You have literal Satan, Satan's ex-wife, hellhounds with skull masks, and now you have an enemy that for all intents and purposes should feel like a twisted amalgamation of body horror. But all I see when I look at this is like a panther with like a unicorn horn. Something important is missing and I can't really put my finger on it. Maybe it's that there's no pain in this creature. It doesn't look like it feels anything and so I feel nothing for it. And that kind of goes for everything in this game except maybe the Sundered Monarch. But we'll get to that. For now let's just say that everything up to this point in this game has just felt like it hasn't even reached the point of being edgy. It's just nothing. Fire monsters are evil because they use fire, but again, like I said, this is mostly subjective. Maybe this is horrifying to someone, but I just find it boring. Upon beating this boss, you'll be given a key to use on the elevator and reach the beacon. This elevator is a somewhat interesting asset. The ability to control the floor you want to go to is some kind of an innovation on standard elevators and souls. However, it doesn't really end up being all that innovative in practice. You use it to get to the top of the tower, and then if you don't have a homeward bone, use it to get back to your last seedbed. That's it. I imagine it would have been hard to implement it in any way that had any real value, but I guess there was some potential here. Taking the opposite path from the tower will lead you to the Abif, but first the Abbess Ursula boss fight. This boss is a masterclass in making a fight annoying. With only like four moves, Ursula manages to make some of the most frustrating moments. Teleporting away the moment of your attack, leaving huge areas of lingering damage over time, and then healing her entire health bar while hiding behind her wall of damage are just to name a few. This is what happens when you put enemies that work better when ran past as world enemies into mandatory fights. It's stupid and unsatisfying, and it doesn't help that the first bonfire of this area is just after this fight. So you'll continue past several copy-paste segments of the Abbey with Gentle Gavroses, Abbess Ursulas, and oh look, Scorched Sisters. Remember that incredible fight from the beginning of the game? She was so much fun. I wonder what she's like to fight at this point in the game. Oh. I guess I'd, I guess I decided to walk past her. I must not have seen her while playing. I guess I guess I just don't see much while playing. Because otherwise, 90% of the content in this game is worth running past unless it's made mandatory. And there's no way that's true. Because that would just make the game bad. Nah, I just must have missed everything. You'll reach the Rune of a Deer and get cocked blocked by this whore who is just a world enemy in the very next area. She's given the ability to Fortnite build laser fences and teleport, which can be extremely disruptive to the pace of the fight. The teleport will unlock you from her, and her next move will generally be a ranged spear attack that you won't see coming if you can't manage to find her again before it lands. If being annoying wasn't enough, she's also basic to the point where you'll be able to dodge every single one of her attacks by sprinting around her. Alternatively, you can perma-stun her with slam moves. Pretty embarrassing, but what do you expect from a game that makes every single half-assed world enemy into a boss? While making your way to the next fight, you'll ascend this umbral set piece, which the Ursulas in this area can fucking shoot through. You could chop this up to the structures being umbral, and therefore the enemy's attacks should go through, but this means in world, they just see our characters flying through the air above them like Peter fucking Pan before 360 no scoping us. It's either that, or the game's spell collisions are just broken, and yeah, maybe. 
Either way, it deals a hit to the game as a whole. Following this, you're made to do one of the most annoying umbral puzzles, in which your success entirely comes down to whether or not your lock-on will work. After obtaining the key for this area, you'll progress to the Judge Cleric boss fight, one of the two unique non-PvP bosses in the entire game. She is unique, right? It's so hard to tell anymore. <laughs> I guess the developers got the copy and paste out of their system by making the paste part of her fight. Her reskin is her face too, and if you ask me, it's actually easier. Being that several of her moves lack a secondary effect when the phase 1 variant left lingering damage bushes behind. I wonder if they plan to make her into two world enemies after the fight, but then realize they made her too important of a character and couldn't get away with it. Anyway, the only thing I have against this fight is the downtime moves. Both phases introduce a move that will have you sprinting around for far too long to make this fight all that enjoyable. This can be made especially grueling if your weapon is low damage, meaning you'll likely see that each downtime move around three times. What further hurts this boss is that most of her combos can be reduced to two hits if you position yourself right behind her, making the dodge and whack meta in this game even stronger, and stagnating the rhythm of this fight. I once again get tired of this fight easily and often consider her to outstay her welcome. Now at this point you've activated all the beacons, and your only path forward is through the turd roots blocking off the path to the Bramus Castle. You return to Upper Calrath, and someone closed the door, blocking your path with an umbral entity. Kind of bothers me when games add artificial blocks to your progress. There's no attempt to give an explanation to the sudden addition of this umbral entity. It's purely to push you through areas you've already been to extend the runtime of the game further. Lucky us, we get to play longer. And so you get to progress in the game after googling where you should go. It's this door, by the way. The random, nondescript, unimportant door at the beginning of the game just happens to open for no reason. Fucking garbage interconnected bullshit. This doorway leads to the beacon side of Upper Calrath, which implies you could have skipped a good chunk of the game, including Fitzroy Gorge, the Ruiner, the Enchantress, the Progeny, the Sewers, and the Skin Stealer, if only you could get this single door opened. And you could have done it before beating Pitya. So you backtrack from this newly opened doorway with your sights set on Bramus Castle, but before you can get there, you're caught up in a fight with the Light Reaver, his real fight this time. Now the fight being here in this giant Colosseum arena begs the question, why didn't we have a boss fight here the first time we came through? If you ask me, the beacon didn't even have a guardian protecting it, and the closest the fight comes to being a guardian is the Skin Stealer. Which again, there's a whole back pathway to the beacon, so it's not exactly like he's protecting the thing very well. I just find it very strange that this could have easily housed a more cinematic and thematic boss protecting the Calrath beacon, but the game that loves reusing assets doesn't use this arena twice. This is a good time for me to address the cumulative elephant in the room that I've been building towards. I'm sure there's been plenty of moments throughout this video where you've questioned my integrity when I call the design of this game lazy. There's bound to have been a moment or two which you've reached a disagreement as to the degree of how upset I should be when analyzing the quality of this game. And don't get me wrong, I encourage the idea that my viewers would be critical towards my work just as I am critical towards others' work. However, I do want to have a very strong leg to stand on when making a whole video essay on a topic, so forgive me for the tangent I'm about to go on, but I feel as though I should address and reinforce my claims so far of the copy and paste that takes place in this game. The difficult part about this argument is that it ultimately lies in the realm of opinion. There are obviously some quantifiable metrics we can look at when determining what reused assets will constitute lazy design or smart design, such as total amount of reused assets or amount of total unique assets, but ultimately this is art we're talking about. Either way, it makes us feel something or it doesn't. At the end of the day, every game is going to reuse assets in one way or another, and why shouldn't they? When an artist puts their time and effort into something and it comes out incredible, it would be a complete waste not to use that asset in multiple places. A simple copy and paste can multiply the value of their design if thoughtfully implemented, and especially so when interesting tweaks are done to make the asset unique and immersive to its new environment. But no matter what you do, the value of its reuse comes completely down to the subjective opinion of the individual. And so I feel as though my only option when making a rational argument in this situation is to fight art with art and opinions with opinions. I'm going to take a series of instances when I thought an asset's reuse was very clever and added to the value of the game, 
and then contrast that to Lords of the Fallen. You'll either see where I'm coming from and how I develop my opinions, or you can just think I'm being a dick because I didn't like the game and didn't get a refund. Either way. Let's start by taking apart my sacred cow, if you would prefer to call it that, Elden Ring. Elden Ring is an easy target for a lot of people, being that it's the largest Souls game to ever exist. There is almost certainly a part of the massive world that you thought was complete garbage, myself included. The Godskin Duo is fucking awful. There are areas in Faramazula that still give me nightmares. The fire giant is dog shit, even though I've heard people call him a sleeper hit. And like I said at the beginning of this video, I was highly critical of Millennia. However, despite all that, Elden Ring's asset spam is in service to something that no other Souls game can really manage to claim. Elden Ring is a game about exploration. It's a big world with so much to see and experience, good and bad, that the feeling of giving you a world full of challenges to adventure through is palpable. The fact that they've reused the same tree avatar so many times doesn't really matter when the minor Erd tree it's protecting is new to you, a new corner of the world that you've never seen. Many small pieces copy and pasted across this world create something greater than the sum of its parts. Let's take a smaller sample size and sink our teeth in. The Crucible Knights are a recurring enemy in Elden Ring. There are Winged Tail Swinging Knights, Fire Frog Knights, Horned Knights, and Spear Wielding Knights. There's probably some variations in between, but I was just going off of memory. At least some of these enemies are the exact same as another, a direct copy and paste, and yet their lore states that each one is unique. There is a total of 13 knights left alive, and you can hunt down each one in one playthrough. The first you'll likely encounter is locked away in an ever jail in early Limgrave, and it functions quite well as a boss fight. It has attacks you can jump over, and attacks you can parry. It attacks with his sword and shield in various ways, and even has a phase 2 that uses a spell which he drops as a unique reward for beating him. It's pretty memorable, and by the time you see the next knight, it'll likely be a world enemy variant. However, this enemy is never used in ways that would imply they're just world enemies. You find them in specific locations that make them feel somber and alone, unmoving while overlooking vast sceneries. Their presence is a challenge to you, disturb their peace at your own peril. The fact that they don't respawn after killing them makes them feel more real than the basic enemies around them. They're special, a challenge that you'll want to do more, but only get a handful of chances in any playthrough. Now let's compare that to Lords. You fight gentle Gavaris, then see a hundred more in the Abbey just like her. You fight Scorn's sister, then see three more of her in the Abbey. You fight Ice intro boss guy, and then see like ten more of him in the Fief. The fact that only one of these enemies is the special one only highlights how unspecial the normal variant is. And then when you realize that the special one is only special because of paper-thin gimmicks, they feel like a non-special enemy that was forced into the position of boss fight without the proper credentials. Maybe it's unfair to compare Lords to one of the greatest games of all time. Let's instead compare it to one of its peers, Lies of P. Lies of P has several moments when boss fights are reused. The first is the Scrapped Watchman. The joke of the Scrapped Watchman is that he was scrapped as a functioning police officer, being that he was too horrifying and dangerous. The fight itself proved that he's very functional, if the function was to destroy puppet boys. After finally scrapping the Scrapped Watchman, you progress a good point into the game before winding up in a trash dump in a fight with the Green Swamp Monster, a carcass creature resulting from Ergo's effects on the biological matter in the dump, at least one could assume. Upon reaching phase 2, the creature slithers against and into a piece of metal you might not have noticed as there in the heat of battle. The scrap watchman you previously destroyed is given new life when introduced to the ergo of this monster's body, and the two become one. The resulting emotion elicited in this moment usually sounds something like, oh fuck, not this guy again. This instantaneous response alone shows the level of respect you felt for the Watchman when putting him behind you as an early challenging moment, and now that he's back, souped up and placed as a phase 2, you know you're in for just as much of a challenge as before, even despite the fact that most of his new moveset will be familiar to you. This is objectively incredible design, that's well implemented in every way. It's thematically relevant, being that it's pushing the narrative of Ergo giving things life, bringing them back more monstrous. It's chronologically thoughtful, leaving just enough time in between the fights to give an exciting surprise while also having the timeline make sense as to how the Watchmen ended up there. The visual design of the boss builds on both of its previous forms. 
giving it a new identity and stronger attacks using attributes of both of its design styles, such as familiar slams with puppet arms followed by new tentacle slashes that the player will have to adapt to. All of this is while saving development time and reusing assets, hitboxes, and animations. Absolutely genius. Now let's compare that to Lords. You fucking can't. There's nothing valuable about the way Lords reuses content. It's purely to avoid having to make a real fight. And that's the real difference here. They're not trying to make art. They're trying to sell a Souls game. Because that's what makes money right now. And if your only goal is to have a functioning game to sell, you might just miss the forest for the trees and end up with the most boring, hollow, soulless Souls game to ever exist. Modern FromSoft games often reuse arenas. This is because a good boss arena is like a canvas you can paint an interesting encounter on without having to design a new canvas. And that is why this arena is empty the first time through it. Because these devs didn't have any ideas. There was nothing to easily copy and paste here. That's it. The Light Reaper fight is once again started with the downtime of his four dragon moves, which is just as exciting as the other three times you've previously seen them in his other arenas. Upon a first playthrough, you'll likely not realize that this infernal enemy has a one-time umbral mechanic, which essentially renders him immune. The grab point to break this is, obviously, outside of his arena, because Light Reaper hasn't wasted enough of your time there. So enjoy the run back, which might just have been at Firelink Shrine, being that there's only one possible seedbed in between. So you do a brain-dead umbral puzzle and then watch the dragon moves again. What could this mechanic possibly add to the game? That's not to mention just how unfitting this mechanic is narratively. The Light Reaper seems to be an anti-umbral entity, hunting down the lamp bearers in hopes of preventing them from doing the radiant or umbral endings. And yet this umbral entity will guarantee his survival unless dealt with. This can once again only come down to laziness. Both this and the umbral entity blocking your path from the upper Kalrath bonfire can assumably be chopped up to an easy way to extend the runtime of the game using some of the few assets they had on hand to do so. The actual fight with Light Reaper is fine but with flaws. The massive combo he can do can also come without telegraph, meaning your best option is to constantly backpedal and sprint away until the boss shows you his ass. This is very unengaging gameplay. There's also the addition of lava pools in his dash move, the design of which fails to consider how spastic the camera system acts when tracking fast moving targets. No matter how you dodge, when locked onto him you'll generally end up standing in the lava when the attack is done, unless you lock off and dodge away from him, which once again disengages you from the flow of combat. After beating Reaper, you might be thinking the game is coming to an end with the most personal antagonist disposed of, Yet, trust me, there is an agonizing amount of so-called content to go. This leaves Light Reaper as a forgettable footnote to the end of the beacon section of the game. And only compounds how frustrating it is that he was teased over and over, forcing you into runbacks each time. Either that, or you beat him early, and he's that much more forgettable by the end of the game. What's much more memorable, for all the wrong reasons, is the upcoming fight with the Iron Wayfarer blocking your access to Bramus Castle. This wannabe Gideon character has basic enough moves in Phase 1, which would work fine as an NPC fight for the sake of the narrative. However, in these dickheads' mindless attempt to make every fight as difficult as possible at the cost of rewarding skillful gameplay, they gave him a Phase 2 with exploding wither mines placed at the point of each of his slam attacks. This fight serves well as a perfect example as to why the pathetic attempt at adding a parry into this game results in frustrating, messy, and insulting gameplay. The wither damage from the mines works to tee you up for a free one-hit kill, which can be completely out of your hands when the resulting performance issues resulting from spawning 300 ambient effects into this chode of an arena cause your frames to implode. That's all I really have to say. If you see this gameplay behind me and think this is an acceptable challenge in a Souls-like game, then your opinion is irrelevant to me. And I think you need to talk to your doctor about upping your dose of whatever drug you take to keep you tethered to reality because clearly it's not working. What erodes the slight bit of good faith I may have had left in the developers of this steaming pile of shit is the fact that they had so much confidence in their work that they made this poorly designed half ass character laugh at you when you inevitably die when you fail to dodge within the single frame per second of gameplay you see in this trash. Absolutely embarrassing. The next 20 minutes of gameplay amounts to an umbral grab puzzle while being attacked from all angles, 
Another boring, pointlessly gimmicky NPC fight. Stupid, who cares? An umbral puzzle while being attacked from all angles. An umbral puzzle with no threat, which just feels like busy work. And if you hadn't realized it already, you would now that the umbral puzzles are simple to the point where there can be no interesting gameplay within them whatsoever. You either have one in combat and it's frustrating, or you have one outside of combat and it's mind numbing. The system is completely hollow. At this point you'll meet the fire squid enemies and I'm not going to bury the lead on this one. They're just a reskin to the Ursulas from the Abbey. They're just as unengaging and each one is flanked by adds and they are mandatory to kill to continue the game. Which is especially incompetently designed within this set piece where the squid is surrounded by flaming hollows which seem to just explode randomly dealing a large amount of damage. A ruiner falls you into the fray, and a nail knight sits just below the staircase, waiting to join the fight when you've made enough noise. Actually, I, it's probably a proximity thing, because the game doesn't even have a stealth function. Enemies will turn to you no matter how slowly you approach them. After spending a miserable amount of time here, you'll find this key, the royal key, positioned on a random bookcase for some reason. And you'll ascend the castle, falling down into the spooky red crystal cavern and have one more fight with a squid and a ruiner before reaching the Sundered Monarch. He'll start the fight passively, only swatting at you and slamming the ground in rage when you provoke him. With my rightfully pessimistic attitude towards Lords of the Frame Rate, I would first consider this phase to be needless and stupid, forcing you to learn a very simple Phase 1 moveset that lasts like 6 hits before the fight really begins. However, upon understanding this fight further, I came to realize that this phase is thematically important, and so it gets a pass. The rest of the fight uses some basic but well-designed slam attacks. The fire or wind attack that results from the slam encourages you to use mindful positioning to keep your iframes active while dodging the hit and the after effect. This is reminiscent of Gale's cape in DS3. The most interesting of his slam moves is this two-hit combo in which he sweeps the statue head upward and slams it on the follow-through, keeping you on your toes as you have to dodge twice in quick succession or you'll eat the secondary blast. The only facet of this fight that I consider entirely sloppy are the two different sweeping combos he can do. These attacks have awkward hitboxes, which imply the swords embedded in his arms are dealing the damage, when in practice it feels like his tits are just hitting you in the face or something. They also have severe telegraphing issues with some of the attacks hitting nearly instantly with no warning. What's worse, one of these combos will punish you for engaging with it, as it sweeps in a 360 arc, resulting in different timings depending on your positioning and the potential to dodge into the first bit of the attack, yet still be hit by the follow through. The boring answer to this is to sprint away from the attack, disengaging completely, yet still receiving an opening to damage when the combo ends with one of the well-designed slam moves. The other combo is even less difficult to ignore as it will end if you can get behind him, resulting in another instance of the get behind an attack meta rearing its boring ugly head. Besides these combos, the fight is fine, I kind of like it, and it doesn't seem to drag on like the other fights have. The real way this fight shines, however, is in his given up state resulting from lowering his health almost completely. No matter what you do, the boss will bleed out from this point. And rather than fight you, he slowly crawls back to the bust of his late wife to mourn her one last time. He never wanted to fight us. We provoked him, and when it comes down to it, he was only temporarily fueled by a blind rage. That once gone left him once more with nothing but sorrow. He dies clutching the statue of his wife's head, which crumbles in his grasp. What a bizarrely beautiful moment in such an emotionally mundane game filled with cackling evil assholes who lack even the most basic depth. It's such a fucking shame that the rest of this game exists, because this moment absolutely does not make up for even a fraction of the garbage content that surrounds it. In fact, it's all the more insulting to know that these devs are capable of creating something unique and with depth, but it only means that they chose not to for everything else in favor of saving time and money on development. Which leads me to the final insult. The reason I uninstalled, the reason I requested a refund, the final boss of the game. A gank fight that has you killing specific glowing zombie adds which gain the ability to throw fireballs and continuously drop pools of lava at their feet, all while the boss goes in a fucking yap sesh in the background. This is how you wanted to end your game? You just barely managed to have a modicum of genuine emotion and visual storytelling in your game, and you follow it with your big bad monologuing over a shitty, boring gank fight. 
Are you kidding me? And of course, you had to meet your meaningless obligation for challenge, even when the fight you designed is nothing but 50 of the same zombies with pyro powers. So sure, just have them standing in pools of lava the whole time. Fuck it. Why not throw in some bug sucking while you're at it? Fucking insulting garbage. So that's the most conventional ending to the game, but what about the other paths you would take? Well, you have the infernal ending, which thankfully skips a deer. However, it makes you visit every single beacon again, none of which are positioned near bonfires. This tedious extra step takes about 20 minutes to complete, and your rewards include a cutscene and the Lord class. There's no replacement final boss. The Umbral ending has you killing your fellow NPCs, including the fucking blacksmith, so you better hope your weapon is upgraded before doing it, as well as Damarose, that one fire hoe in Bram's castle. Yeah, her name was apparently Damarose. And this skips her boring pointless fight in Bramus, so that's nice. You also kill the Iron Wayfarer in the Umbral. Unfortunately, this can only take place after beating his dog shit boss fight. You couldn't have just given us that one. It's kind of funny how rewarding it is to skip things in this game. The less content, the better, I guess. On that note, there's also an unlockable class, the Dark Crusader. That's not tied to an ending, but an NPC's questline. This quest has you grabbing pieces of lore before fighting a terrible NPC style boss fight with some dickhead who can summon a bunch of lightning strikes that follow you around, and also he can heal. It's pretty trash. Not worth doing. The interesting part of this is that the deluxe edition of the game, for 10 extra dollars, will unlock the class for you immediately. Now to me, a deluxe edition should be giving the player something that a fan of the game would want say, a fun skin or something stupid like that. Or in the case of Dishonored 2, Corvo's Mask. It's really just a way to show your love to the developers and give them some more money to support their cause. So why would the deluxe edition of this stupid piece of shit include the reward for an in-game quest? Wouldn't the only people who give a shit enough to do this extra quest already be the people who bought the deluxe edition? Just kind of seems weird and backwards to me. In the most basic terms, games are just rewards waiting to be claimed with challenges blocking your way to them. And with that outlook, the Deluxe Edition is like paying more to get less game. And honestly, I kind of get that. If I could, I would without hesitation pay $80 to have never purchased this piece of shit game. So long as the money went to FromSoft, you know, the guys these pricks stole all their ideas from. Got a little off track there, but the Umbral ending will eventually have you soulfully the Firekeeper to enter the boss fight, which takes place at the bottom of the depths. This transition of setting will make your game run like shit for a good minute between every attempt. That was until I learned I could just backtrack to the last bonfire in the area and try again from there. I assumed this fight was taking place in Piteous Flayed Soul or something, but it's just there in the depths. Maybe there's a lore reason for that, but I don't really care. The fight is a bullet hell with the second ghost Pitya showing up every once in a while. If defeated, the Pitya will stun the real one for a critical attack, but you can't really guarantee that you'll be able to kill her before she despawns and you'll feel as though you've just wasted your time. This is especially frustrating being as that she floats just far enough in the air that my weapon would miss her about every other opening. Overall, this fight is visually interesting, and that's about it. A bullet hell is an obviously stupid design for a Souls game. The fight is just a reskin with a bunch of extra noisy assets thrown in, and beating it unlocks the Putrid Child class. <sighs> so that's it. Finally everything covered. A Souls-like with like, three good fights if I'm being generous, lazy uninspired design throughout, terrible optimization, truly ungodly optimization and one moment that made me feel anything more than rage, frustration, or most frequently boredom. So let's look at this monstrosity as a whole. What is there of real value? You have a reboot of an old RPG game, which means the world building was already established from another product. You have the gameplay items, bonfires, weapons, and all sorts of general ideas which were stolen from FromSoft games, and use the hype that the term Souls-like brings with it. You have a world filled with so much copy and paste that the vast majority of boss fights are just reskins. You have the worst FPS issues I have ever experienced with a bare minimum of two full crashes per playthrough. You have seamless co-op that exemplifies the performance issues through netcode and allows you to exploit the low stagger resist of many bosses by ganking them. 
You have PvP that everyone hates and seems to just be broken at times. So what's left, you may ask? The lamp. The umbral lamp which allows you to enter and return from another world. A different world with new paths forward, but also new challenges. And that's my idea. That is an original thought. So if you've never played a delightful little game from 2016 called Dishonored 2, let me introduce you to the Outsider's Timepiece. A device that allows you to peer into another world and slip between those worlds to overcome challenges, do puzzles to obtain items, or move forward throughout the level. Sound fucking familiar. But that's not all it does, because Dishonored 2 is a very complex and interesting game. The timepiece allows you to enter the past, as this dilapidated mansion once housed a cult which performed a ritual that broke it free of time. In the past, the mansion flourished with elegance and luxury, while also swarming with armed guards. Being a stealth game which encourages you to never be seen and never kill anyone, this is obviously a much more dangerous situation for a rogue such as your character to be in, rather than the rundown mansion of the present which only houses feral dogs, blood flies, and weepers. However, returning to the past and altering it can lead to some very interesting logic puzzles. For example, there's a locked room with a valuable item left inside. However, the door is locked both in the past and the present. Although, in the dilapidated present, the wall has broken and bowed out with rubble. By going into the past, crouching under this desk, then returning to the present, you gain access to this room. The interior of which houses this now looted safe which once contained your prize. The code to open the safe should still be readable on its door, however, the bloodfly nest which grew on top of it have cemented over its face. When entering the past, you see a dog corpse within this room. By understanding the world the game is set in, you know that bloodflies require decomposing flesh to build their nests. And so, you throw the dog's body in the nearby incinerator to dispose of it properly, and when you return, the flies had never built there. You can then see the code which was used to open the safe before returning to the past to enter the code and loot it. Now even if we're being generous and assume the similarities between the umbral lamp and the outsider's timepiece were entirely coincidental or a case of cryptonesia, what did Lords of the Fallen do with their mechanic? It's so fucking meaningless. I feel like I've made this point ten times over at this point, but the umbral is such a fucking nothing burger. It's absolutely moronic to have so many issues present themselves in your game directly because of its inception all while not designing a single bit of interesting gameplay around it. The system is fundamentally flawed from the ground up, being hindered by the inability to switch between worlds at will through the needless buffer life system which corrodes the potential for difficulty and balance. What do I mean by this? Well, I've been saying this for years now, but what's even the point of living? Aside from the obvious free life you benefit from while in the living world, there is absolutely nothing interesting or special about it, and based on the restrictive way the umbral mechanic is built, there can't be anything interesting. The only way any puzzle can play out within this system is by always having to first go umbral, and then just lamp pulling everything in sight. The restrictive nature of the umbral lamp is largely in service to the buffer life, which, if you ask me, means the game can never really be challenging in any meaningful way. When you're given an entire life bar of extra fuck-ups, the only way to design any boss that can stand up to you in terms of survivability is by making every fight an endurance match, slowly whittling you down flask by flask until killing you and then killing you again. Many of these bosses will actually bore you to death, repeating their simple movesets so many times that you're bound to eventually fall asleep at the wheel, enough so that you might be tricked into thinking this game was actually difficult. The unfortunate thing is that you couldn't even fix this system if you wanted to. The umbral buffer life is largely critical to keeping your sanity while playing. Most of the encounters, set pieces, enemy placements and designs, platforming sections, and boss fights are so poorly designed that the second chance you get acts as a bandage, keeping the game just barely playable. You can feel what I mean when the game forces you to go umbral, usually in the absolute most fucking stupid situations possible, like the Hollow Crow fight, where you'll feel a palpable anxiety that something stupid will soon cuck you to death. This is the bedrock of Lords of the Fallen. 
It is built on a lack of confidence within the Souls-like genre. You get a free life, but the game still has to be difficult, and so the two ideals constantly conflict with each other, and this leaves the Umbral with both no place in this world, but also taking up huge amounts of space in this world. It's everywhere, yet adds nothing, and it was the only thing that made this game unique. I'm usually not the kind of guy who gives games numeric ratings, being that the metric doesn't take into consideration the scope and scale of the game in question. For example, I think Halo 3 is a perfect game, 10 out of 10. It did everything it set out to do immaculately. On the other hand, I wouldn't feel comfortable giving Elden Ring a 10 out of 10 due to the many flaws I find in its design. However, I still see Elden Ring as a better game than Halo 3 because it does more, it has a larger scope and scale. For everything it fails at, it succeeds 10 times over in many other areas. However, for Lords of the Fallen, I will make an exception and give it a rating of negative 10 out of 10. Yes, this is just to be petty, but here's my reasoning. If a 0 out of 10 is to do nothing, then actively causing damage would be worse than that, right? Lords of the Fallen unceremoniously steals from its so-called peers, it learns nothing from the past, repeating several failed mechanics and finishing old failed mechanics that were scrapped by devs with better foresight. It's an insult to its players, throwing reskin after reskin at you while asking you not to notice. It's an insult to the industry, cynically pumping out the most popular game of the time without understanding a single thing about how Souls likes work more than simply copying the aesthetics and it asks you to pay 70 fucking dollars to be an unconsenting beta tester, which brings me to the patch notes. During my many miserable playthroughs over the last month, there were several, let's call them large, updates. The fucking patch notes would certainly want you to think they were quite extensive, listing every single minute change within. There's been about 20 updates in total with varying degrees of changes, and I certainly don't care enough to go through every single change. These changes do however point to the idea that this game was absolutely not finished on release. I would have had no problems with this if it was advertised as an early access title and sold for an appropriate price, $25 at most. But that is far from how things have played out. A full release in this state, including a deluxe edition, is nothing short of criminal false advertising, and anyone who is able to review this game before its release, giving it a score above even a out of touch 6, should feel ashamed of their lack of integrity. The developers were quick to throw flowery, flattering words at the situation, such as ongoing feedback, community engagement, and roadmap of free content, when the obvious reality of the situation is that they never played their own game as even basic internal feedback by anyone remotely competent would have resulted in the game releasing in a very different state. They cut costs by never hiring testers and fixing their dog shit game after release. For the sake of my own personal integrity, let's just say this is a theory of mine, but what's the alternative? They hired testers who okayed the game shipping in this state? I find that hard to believe. So let's just look at their beta progress so far by analyzing an insulting, embarrassing, out-of-touch graphic recently released. To start, the first two sections highlight a comparison between New Game and New Game Plus changes. The first piece of information we can look at is a visual representation of the enemy density changes with two of the five men being grayed out, assumedly a reduction of the original release by 40%, whereas New Game Plus will revert back to full density. Now let's look at the patch notes themselves. To quote, The entire game has received an enemy density pass, with the number of mobs reduced by up to 30% in some of the most challenging areas. Am I missing something? Because the graph itself doesn't show a reduction of up to 30%, unless the new game plus were to add additional mobs, which the graphic fails to show. Either I'm fucking stupid or the developer slash marketing team are, and I'm just gonna put my money on both. The next image shows us the vestiges are unchanged in New Game, but the majority of vestiges are available in New Game Plus. So they did end up patching it. My question becomes, why not just leave all the bonfires in? Is it because you just can't let a bad idea die? If anything, it would make the game much more challenging if you removed the vestige seat in the game, but that would rely on having good bonfire placements in the first place, which this game certainly does not have. Anyway, the next graphic shows an increased boss difficulty. Noting increased moveset, more aggressive, and enhanced behaviors, with the New Game Plus showing the same. Is this supposed to imply the changes are even further increased in New Game Plus? I don't know. 
but let's just look at the information I have. As far as I know, the only boss they've directly changed was the Sundered Monarch, which, in their words, the Sundered Monarch boss encounter has received a full revamp and, as a result, is more challenging, achieved without tweaking his HP or damage output, purely behavior upgrade. It's tougher. Now this mentions absolutely nothing about increasing his moveset, and this is the only fight which had the potential to be changed in such a way as far as I'm aware. The only caveat I have for this is that it seems like some of his moves didn't have an after effect slam on them before, and so, as far as I'm concerned, the phrasing of the words increased moveset is just an absolute lie. More aggressive? Sure. Enhanced behaviors? Sure, why not? But increased moveset? I have found no evidence to support that. Now the final insult to this section was only implied, never directly stated in this graphic, as the recent increase of difficulty changes amounted to nothing more than a 10% increase on health on most bosses in the game and slight damage increases. My main complaint across this whole review was that the boss fights are just too boring and often outstay their welcome, and these morons decided to buff boss health almost across the board fucking ridiculous. You can't save this project with any amount of tweaks. It's rotten to the core. Now moving on to the next change the devs were proud enough to include on a ridiculous graphic that looks like the kind of thing that Bungie would release in their most desperate moment. Improved enemy leashing. Now if you had played the game on release, you would know that it felt as though enemies had no leashing whatsoever. Only losing aggro when the player hits a bonfire or goes up a ladder which, if true, means the word improved leeching is also just a lie. Either that, or the devs purposely decided that enemies should be able to chase you into boss fights, or they were just lazy and gave default leeching values to enemies without thinking about the placement in regards to fog walls. Even after this update, I had a Gorgon enemy as part of the Light Reaver fight, so think of this change as you will. The rest of the changes are very simple and probably don't deserve their own tile on a press release style graphic. Nerfed archers, nerfed some of the smaller dog-like adds, but only if you can get a grievous strike on them, which would have probably killed them anyway. I don't know, kind of a weird change. They made better summons, giving the update a silly title implying that it was larger and more groundbreaking than it actually was, the Braided Ring update. Finally, they split PvP and PvE balancing. I don't think anyone cared, PvP is garbage. Lastly, one thing they didn't even include on this graphic is the complete revamp they made to the lock-on system. Still sucks ass. They also broke the gentle Gavaris fight with it. I think that's everything I have to cover at this point. The whole mythos of this game. However, I do want to include a lightning round of honorable mention fuck-ups that I didn't get around to mentioning. Firstly, tying the jump button to the same button which picks up items and initiates ladder climbs seems like an oversight, as you'll often find yourself jumping over items and ladders, sometimes to your death. There are some issues with the mesh of the ground in many areas, stopping you from running seemingly for no reason. Another issue is that you can miss the Firelink bonfire, and will have to find the closest route back. Being the hub world, I assumed the bonfire would automatically unlock when the Skybridge intro cutscene is played. It doesn't help that there isn't much of a reason to stop at Firelink on your first visit, so you'll have to remember to unlock it before continuing down the linear path. Speaking of which, the only important thing to do at your first visit to Firelink is to upgrade your Sanguinarix. Upon doing so, you'll experience my next complaint, that every single character wants to go on a fucking yap sesh before letting you use their services. This is especially bad with Pitya as her animation plays every time you want to upgrade the flask. If you wanted me to care about the characters in this world, the world would have had to not suck ass first. Talking to these assholes should be an option. Stop wasting my time. Another issue is the embarrassing hitboxes on enemy thrust moves. In classic shitty DS2 fashion, many thrust moves track too closely and have hitboxes that often look as though they hit after any possible movement was already over. Just looks stupid. There's also situations where enemies pile up at umbral gates, blocking your path, and sometimes leaving you with no way of clearing them, depending on your weapon and kit. On the topic of balance, it feels to me that you get very little out of leveling. I played one playthrough without leveling health, and it felt just as frustrating as any other playthrough. Maybe this is chopped up to the umbral buffer life being so OP, I don't really know. On the damage side, the bonus damage you'll get from upgrading weapons seems to overshadow damage stat levels significantly. Lastly, I just think the music was weird. Not even a critique, just a personal opinion. The track for Judge Cleric feels like it should be on a 
hopeful epic turning of the tides of battle moment in a medieval warfare situation or something. Also the Iron Wayfarer music sounds oddly Middle Eastern inspired. Overall, Lords of the Fallen is a very cynical product to its very core. And of course, it's not the first cynical product video game, but Souls-like, maybe. And as I said at the top of this essay, I almost quit playing video games altogether because of products like this. I don't really like thinking about it because it was a pretty dark time for me, and on top of that, my hobby, my distractions, felt like they were abandoning me. Games like Destiny turning into the mess it is today, full of meaningless free-to-play content and monetized loot that also becomes meaningless when the game they exist in fails to please in any way. I could say the same for Ark Survival Evolved, which pushed the sales of their expansions by filling them with overpowered endgame content, leaving base game players unable to compete and overshadowing the value of many base game creatures in the process. The prospect of developers trying to cash in on the popularity of Souls games rather than creating them for the love of the craft is a very real threat, and we don't know the damage these products will do before the damage is permanent. There have been many studies focusing on how profit incentives shape the final end goal that participants were tasked with, with a singular consensus between them being that when motivated by external factors, participants were more likely to cut corners, were more distracted by what they were getting out of it rather than focusing on the task at hand. This is pretty much what you would expect. When motivated only by money, you're gonna do the bare minimum. Whereas when motivated by the goal itself, you're willing to put in the extra effort for it to shine. Capitalism clearly isn't good for art. And I don't think you can disagree with me unless you really like what Disney has been doing over the last decade. Capitalism is more for lifting people out of poverty. You know, stupid shit like that. When it comes to art, it's largely on the fans to support artists in one way or another. And on that note, I made myself a Patreon. If you've made it this far into the video, you're likely either fuming at me for shitting on your favorite game, or maybe you've enjoyed my work. It's certainly taken up a considerable amount of my time over the last month, so I hope the effort invested shows through as a quality final product. If you have enjoyed and wish to support my work or encourage me to continue making content like this, you can use the link in my description to find my Patreon. Know that every cent would be very much appreciated and likely wasted on some other garbage content like Lords of the Fallen, I'll be honest. You can also like this video or dislike it, leave a comment, and send this video to someone who's considering buying this game, or someone you know who loves this game, because it'll piss them off. That's pretty funny. Every bit of engagement I receive will not go unappreciated, especially since I have not made a cent off of YouTube. I'm purely creating this video to spread as much righteous negativity about Lords of the Fallen as possible. Because I'm too cynical to believe that these devs are anything more than money-hungry thieves. When I see manipulative marketing with overly designed graphics that only really show a basic level of patching broken parts of their game while calling you part of a community, the only thing I see is a farmer licking his lips while fattening you up for the slaughter. Because there's no such thing as free content, and I don't know yet what form the monetization of this game will take, be it microtransactions, paid for events, or god forbid a Souls game with a fucking battle pass. Make no mistake, there's going to be a moment where they aim for your wallet. There is no reason they currently have to futilely attempt to patch this product. It is hemorrhaging terrible design. It will never be great. It will never even be good. But it just might be familiar enough to get a few people hooked while waiting for Elden Ring DLC. And I don't mean to be dramatic, but the success of this vile imitation could truly mean the end of Souls games as we know it. There are just too many people willing to choke down this disgusting slop using a misguided version of the get good mindset to push through to the end, and then rewriting history in their minds. 9 out of 10? Are you fucking kidding me? Everyone on this image should never be taken seriously again. The charitability towards this game is so undeserved especially when it could potentially be causing damage to the very games its design steals from. It costs the same amount as Elden Ring. It costs more than every other Souls game. And so why, I ask you, would FromSoft design something that takes so much more time, so much more effort, so much more intelligence and ingenuity, and so much more creativity, when their fans are just as willing to compliment lazy, cynical, unfinished garbage? Why would they make you a $70 steak dinner when you'll pay the same amount to eat the scraps scraped off in the dishes at the end of the night? And that's why it's important to be critical because quality matters. And I know there will be plenty of people who like this game and are willing to argue in its defense because of their affinity towards it. Just keep in mind that you can like something even despite it being fucking garbage. Enjoyment is largely an involuntary response. 
For me, I enjoyed the anime Vinland Saga quite a bit. The fighting scenes are well animated, and a dual knife-wielding child warrior is aesthetically a cool premise. However, I think objectively Vinland has some of the worst character development I've ever seen, and this is an anime that forces its morals down your throat over and over despite never showing you the main character actively making a decision on his own, and never having to learn from those morals until the final episode when it just randomly happens. I still like the show, and I can't really help that but I know it's pretty terrible. I would never tell someone what to like and what not to. Enjoy what you will. But I do think that if you have any sense of intellectual consistency, you shouldn't be able to appreciate the quality of this without on some level also hating this. And so that's it. All I really wanted was my $70 back. They could have given me my rightfully deserved refund and I may have never thought of this game again. Hell, I might have even repurchased it after a while if some DLC came out along with significant enough patches to trick me again. But I didn't get my money back. Instead, I now have this. A video I'm proud of. A video made to prevent people from making my mistakes. Made in hopes that people will strive to maintain quality feedback in order to keep Souls games good for at least a couple more years. And now I need an Excedrin and to jerk off, so... Thank you so much for watching.